So welcome, welcome, welcome our remarkable and beloved colleague, John. We so appreciate your consistent leadership and solidarity. And as always at Setsi, we begin all things by giving thanks to our creator, by acknowledging giving thanks to all the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So that being said, John, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers and share a bit about your remarkable work? Well, thank you very much, Victor. It is really, really wonderful to be here. And I'm joining you this morning from Vancouver, from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And as you said, we, we give thanks to those who've allowed us to live, work, and play on this land that they've stewarded for many, many millennia. Um, and I'm excited. I'm excited to, to talk to you today. So a little bit about me. Um, I am the CEO of Real Life Strategies Cooperative, which is a social enterprise consultancy based in Vancouver that works uh, primarily with nonprofits, social enterprises, um, and cooperative social economy organizations across the country to help improve their ability to thrive, <clears throat> pardon me, in ever-changing and sometimes very difficult worlds. I've been um, fortunate <clears throat> to, to be the CEO of Realize now for 12 years, uh, which is a long time and I've seen a lot of changes in that. And I've had a lot of very interesting things that have happened to me in that journey. Uh, one that I'm particularly excited about, Victor, and it's something that, that uh, I think you and I are both passionate about, is having been one of the founders of Bisocial Canada with our dear friend, David LePage. And that was, in some respects, born out of the, the years I spent. I, I was very fortunate earlier in my, my life to be on the board of Fair Trade Canada and Fair Trade International for a number of years. And, you know, that's a global organization that supports um, producers in the global south, in Africa, in Asia, and Latin America, to have better access for their cooperatives to markets in the north. So I'm very passionate about that ability to give a better opportunity for people who are often marginalized in the economy to have fair access and a better shake uh, in building for their families and their communities. And that's always been a passion for me. And today I'm very, very humbled to um, now be in my fifth year as the chair of the board of, of Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada, which the national organization uh, for cooperatives across Canada from the very large to the very small. So that's something that, again, gives me the the good opportunity, the good fortune to be able to work out just with cooperators across Canada, but also to be able to inter interact with cooperators from around the world. Um, and that, uh, th that work to me is very exciting and very inspiring. And I'm just delighted that I get to play a small part in our collective work to build a better economy where um, there is no such thing as marginalization, where everybody has an equal opportunity um, to build their communities, to support their families, and to feel fully engaged in everything that they do. That's absolutely remarkable, sir. My goodness, such a body of work. David LePage is one of my favorite people. Um, so, and I've worked closely with Bi Social Canada for a long time. And I did not know that you were the board chair of CMC. Daniel Burnett is one of my close colleagues as well. Um, yeah. So I think I'm, um, and, and, and did not know about your work with Fair Trade Canada as well. So, once again, I'm, I'm usually very prepared for these conversations. I call <laughs> realized strategies. I wasn't aware of your extensive body of work. It's absolutely tremendous. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. So my next well, thank question, you, Victor. It's yeah. So my next question is, what's inspiring you right now? What has you curious, or what's keeping you up at night? Oh wow, there's a there's quite a question, Victor. I guess what's keeping me up at night, honestly, is we seem to be at least in uh, in my part of the country in some tougher economic times right now. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of organizations, both private sector companies, uh, social economy organizations like mine, who are feeling uh, a, a very different economy right now for reasons that no one really understands. Um, but we all feel it. Uh, and I've been talking to some uh, cooperatives over the course of this week who are telling me the same thing, that uh, they're having to hunker down and figure out how to how to survive and asking for, for advice and, and help to get there. So that's the thing that's keeping me awake at night, Victor. What's exciting me is I think what I continue to see in the growth 
of interest in the social economy and in, in more and more companies that are making the journey to be purpose-based. Um, we have the uh, B Corp Global Champions Retreat coming up in a couple weeks here in Vancouver, which I'm really looking forward to because, again, we've been part of that movement now for, I think, nine or almost 10 years we've been a certified B Corp. And, and just so seeing that it's becoming more and more of a reality. Um, you know, even last night in the State of the Union address, President Biden talked about it's time to increase taxes on billionaires and the very wealthy. And, that, and it was interesting to hear that some Republicans even agreed with them, because to me that starts to say people are understanding that we have got to change the fundamental economic circumstances that we live in. We can't have a society where there are some very, very, very wealthy people who have more money than 99 or more than 99 percent of the rest of us it just doesn't make sense so that's something that i'm i'm excited about i'm excited to see that more people want to be living in a world where purpose is the thing that and, and a purpose that's not just about profit making is core to what we need to do in building our communities i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more i had a great conversation with one of my colleagues on bill young yesterday and the whole thing was around just a widening gap in wealth inequality and, and there's so many ways that we can go about from a public policy stance as you mentioned the state of the union address regulatory frameworks or even just the actors in the state stakeholders institutional investors uh, um, like pension funds like there's so many folks that could actually make things better for those on the margins the periphery of the economy but once again it takes will it takes skill um, but what there's a will is a way and I think um, mm -hmm. I'm an optimist by nature because I have four children. So by default, I'm <laughs> have quite a few grandchildren. So so the world has to get better. Um, and I'm going <laughs> to be done just to see, see that happen. So my next question, what challenges and barriers are you facing in your work? And how are you and your team working to overcome these challenges and barriers? Again, great question, Victor. And I, I touched on my earlier answer. Um, right now, we are really grappling with a an economic environment that is different than I've seen in my 12 years stewarding real life strategies. Um, you know, we're a business because much of what we do is consulting work. It's demand driven. It's hard to predict. Um, and in the last number of months, we've seen a real change from what we normally experience. Uh, and it has meant that we've had to make some, unfortunately, very difficult decisions to reduce our, our costs. Um, so my colleagues and I are, uh, trying to understand how we can continue to thrive while we work our way through these challenges um, and uh, hopefully come out stronger in the end. At the same time, we are um, in the very early phases of piloting some some new things or, or starting to think about some new directions for our organization, one of which is um, looking much more into social impact investment. Um, and partly because we've had a very long standing and very successful partnership with uh, Van City that uh, has provided us um, great support for our members uh, and, and money that assists us in doing our work. So now we're looking at maybe we can use some of that to do good work in the community. Um, but at the same time, we are a member based organization and we're also looking at some of the challenges that our members are facing. Many of them are funded by governments and, and donors and uh, they're having some some challenging times. So we're really trying to figure out what can we do, albeit as a relatively small organization, um, but one with, I think, you know, a fairly a fairly well-known footprint in B. So how do you mm -hmm. feel about the future of social impact in Canada? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you hopeful? How are you feeling? I'm well, I'm like you, Victor. I'm I'm hopeful and optimistic by nature. Um, so I am hopeful. Uh, about the the landscape, but I think there's a lot of hard work to do too, because I look at where traditional capital is still at, VCs, angel investors, private investors. We hear a lot of talk about impact, but when you strip away all the nice stuff that you hear and you get down to what are you actually doing, it still looks pretty traditional to me. It's still impact is really, can you deliver a 10X return on, on the exit of your business? And we expect you to sell your business, by the way. Um, not to the kind of, you know, not necessarily in the way that John Shell and his colleagues at Social Capital Partners are talking about, sell it to your, but, you know, sell it to the market, somebody who's going to pay a lot of money. I'm optimistic that we can 
break through that mentality. We can shift more and more capital towards being patient, towards investing in communities, towards really, really putting impact forward and not in a kind of token performative way, but really in the DNA of what you're trying to do. It's not just about making a 10x return. It's about maybe five or four times return. But what you're going to get in exchange is some real difference in the community. And that's I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic, Victor. I'm hopeful. I may be I may be Pollyannish about it, but uh, you know, if you don't if you don't feel optimistic, and and then where are you? It like it makes life pretty uh, pretty unpleasant to live that way. I couldn't agree more. One of my colleagues, um, Jean Marc from PFC, he just he just said something that's so insightful. He said, "We can't afford the luxury of despair in these times," and I can't. That's right. more. Like we can't afford that luxury at all. Um. So my last question, um, I, I, and this is important to me. Um, like, like, what is your ultimate goal, and what does success look like and feel like to you and your colleagues? And do you have any calls to action for our listeners and our viewers? For me, success in a macro a macro picture looks like the hard work that you do, that we do, that that Buy Social does. Sometimes it feels like it's still in the niche, and my my hope is that it becomes more and more the mainstream. You know, same with in my fair trade days, we'd talk about man, if you took the mark off, would people really care? Well, I hope that they do care about buying differently, using the money to, to, to influence positive change. And if we can see more and more of that, then I think we can all uh, we, we can all go away happy when eventually we retire. And for my team, Victor, I think we really want to get through this this patch of challenge that we're going through right now. And really lean into how we can, as a small team, how we can make a difference in the work that we do directly, in the work that we do with partners and allies like Setsi and Sednet and by Social Can and all the other good organizations that across the country that share our collective vision of a, a fairer, a more just, a more equitable, a more inclusive society. That's remarkable. And I couldn't agree more. So thank you so much for all those actionable insights all those jewels, all the wisdom, and the remarkable work that you've been doing for quite some time. You 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 work diligently on behalf of many communities, and you're truly an inspiration to folks coming up, trying their best to ensure that we live in a more equitable society. So once again, I appreciate all that you do for so many. And as always at Setsi, we close this interview, this conversation, the way it began, by giving thanks to our creator, acknowledging, giving thanks to the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We acknowledge all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We acknowledge all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. John, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Victor. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you today.